Welcome back to the factory. This week, the Picadev color sensor gets a huge code base upgrade to make it much more friendly to use to classify colors. And we've got some hardware prototypes to show off. Let's do it. I haven't talked about the Picadev color sensor in a while, and that's because we've been thinking about the tutorials and how we're going to demonstrate how to use this device. The last time we talked about this, I gave a brief demo just showing how the RGB values change when you hold an object over the sensor. And that's all well and good for measuring the color components of light, but if you want to do something like you know, identify a lime as a lime, it's not quite right. The reason for that is the reflected light that comes off the sample is going to change as it approaches the sensor. And if you're working in an RGB color space, the amount of light that's reflected is going to change those RGB values. And so it's going to change like the, the color that you might infer from that point in three-dimensional color space. And so there was a bit of an aha moment where we decided to convert from RGB data into HSV or hue, saturation, and value, which is kind of like the, the lightness. Unlike RGB color, which just measures the relative components of red, green, and blue light that make up a color, HSV separates the color space into hue, which is represented as like an angle in this cylinder. Saturation, which is like the intensity of the color, how, how colorful that color is. And value, which is like the, the measure of lightness. And so we're working in HSV, we can actually just ignore saturation. And importantly, we can ignore value to identify a color. We just look at the hue dimension to pick out whether it's red, green, blue, orange, etc. As you bring that sample closer and closer, the value is going to change, but the hue is going to stay about the same. And so by ignoring saturation and value, you can basically ignore the differences that different amounts of light entering the sensor make and just look at the hue. Of course, the proof is in the pudding, so I've put together a little demo for you. You can see in the shell, I have a label on the left. Currently, that's none because there's no sample and just the measured hue on the right. And we're in a, we're in a pretty light, noisy environment. We've got some lights uh, shining for this video shoot at the moment. But if I bring this object close to the sensor, we can see that that label turns to lime for a hue of about 78, 75, 73. As I move that around, it's pretty consistent that it's either lime or nothing if there's nothing in front of the sensor. Got an apple and hold that to the sensor and we get an apple with a hue of 20 and finally a carrot with a hue of about 35. And this is exactly what I envisaged a sensor like this being used for, some kind of color sorting project. And so you want that to be as easy as possible to set up. You don't want to have to, you know, figure out, you know, normalizing red, green, blue components to try to figure out which is the dominant color. It's, it's just not worth it. This, this experience where you have just one variable hue on a color wheel, and then you can just define positions on that wheel that mean certain colors. And so in this example code right at the top, I just create a Python dictionary uh, a, a dictionary is, in Python is basically a way to associate a label, say apple, with something else. In this case, an, an integer value 20. So I've measured my apple and when I measured it, it had a hue of 20. So I've just put in 20 in that dictionary. Likewise, I sampled the carrot and sampled the lime, entered their hues. And now we have a list of labeled hues. The sensor is initialized just like every other PicoDev device, just by calling the initialization function. And then when we call the classify hue function, that's what gives us this, this label printout. We just pass in that list as an argument. And so we say, here's a list of known hues, take a hue sample and just find the closest entry in that dictionary and return that label. There's also a minimum brightness being filtered out as well so that if there's nothing being held in front, if there's very little reflected light, then there will be nothing returned. So I come across the idea of different color spaces in the past, but it never really I never really understood the motivation until approaching this problem. I'd come across HSV before and thought, oh, that's just, you know, that's just something for artists or for printers. Not quite sure what the motivation behind it is. But now that I've experienced the problem that it solves, it really closes that loop. Now the color sensor is equipped with this high CRI LED to illuminate a target. So if you want to measure some reflected color, this will illuminate the target and the color will be reflected back. If you want to measure, say, active light, if you want to measure the color of a light source, you can always disable this LED by connecting the LED pin to ground. 
I'm not really sure how we missed this the first time around. Maybe it's just because we're working in quite a bright office or when you're looking at the LED, you get quite dazzled. So when you disable it, it does look like the LED is off. But if, if I cover that LED with some darkness, you can see it's still glowing very slightly. Now, I haven't experienced this before. I'm used to, I'm used to working with MOSFETs where you turn them on, you turn them off, you're done. Maybe you operate in the triode region if you're switching them very quickly or if you're using them as like a constant current load or something. But I haven't experienced this kind of situation where this is the gate of this MOSFET is being pulled to ground, but there's still some leakage. There is like there's clearly some leakage through that MOSFET. This is the topology that the MOSFET's being used in on this device. We have 3.3 volt supply flowing through a current limiting resistor. There's our LED and there's our MOSFET switch. It's being constantly pulled high by a pull-up resistor. There's also a pin connected to the gate so we can pull that down, disable the MOSFET and disable the LED. But when this gate is being pulled to ground, as I've just shown you, there's still some current flowing through this path. Here's the BSS138 data sheet. And if we scroll down through to the characteristics, we can find the parameter we're after, IDSS or the zero gate voltage drain current. This is basically the, the current that will leak through the MOSFET when you've got it turned off. And according to this data sheet, we should be sitting at somewhere between 0.5 and 5 microamps. Oh no, In, according to this, we should be at around 100 nanoamps. Now I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I've, I've measured the voltage across this resistor. I've measured the voltage across this resistor to infer the current that's flowing through the LED. And we're at somewhere in the order of a couple of microamps. So either my transistor is out of spec, maybe during the prototyping process, this is an early prototype, maybe we left it on the hot plate for too long. Not quite sure what's going on there. But regardless, I think this represents a bit of a worst case scenario. And maybe that's how we missed it before. Maybe the LED was disabling before, but now through some quirk, there's some leakage. In any case, we really want to use this transistor. We use it in other circuits. We've got heaps of them for assembling our four channel logic level converter. So there's no good reason to re-specify this part. Maybe it's just prone to a slightly higher leakage than other transistors. And you know, a couple of microamps, this is, this must be an extremely efficient LED to be lighting up, albeit very dimly, at a few microamps. By leaking some small amount of current, this MOSFET is essentially a constant current driver. And so there's enough voltage being developed across the LED with that small current to turn the LED on. So a simple fix is that we can grab a 4K7 I squared C pull up resistor from somewhere else on the circuit. We can take that 4K7 and just put it in parallel with the LED. This will add some kind of parasitic loading. So of course the circuit is gonna draw slightly more current. Not a big deal if there's an extra milliamp going through this resistor, if it means that we can guarantee that LED will turn off. By putting this resistor in the path, that small current will preferentially flow through this resistor. So now the voltage across the LED is gonna be in the order of about 0.23 or 0.24 volts, which is well below its forward voltage. And that will guarantee that the LED turns off. We can really easily test that by connecting a 4K resistor across the LED while we're trying to disable it and observe its behavior. So there you have it, a trap for young players with weak MOSFET foo. But in any case, I learned something. I hope you did as well. Last week we had a bit of a show and tell of some Globit prototypes we've been working on. Those prototypes have arrived. Here's an assembled 1x8 Globit stick. And here we have two soldered together to make one rather long bar graph. The bread boardable 4x4 is assembled with its nice labels on the back. And we're yet to assemble the 8x8. One, because, you know, 64 LEDs, so it's quite a bit of effort to hand place those LEDs. But we've had a little bit of an idea about how we could make the tiling of this a bit more friendly. As it stands with these modules, there's many power and ground connections, and there's a V in on one side and a V out on the other side. So they'll tile very easily in one direction, say from left to right. The idea is if we can make some kind of rotational symmetry to this tile, then we can tile it in more flexible ways without having to use things like air wires between devices. So with the current tiling scheme, you could tile a row and then to tile the next row, you would have to wrap that signal with a cable. But if we can create some kind of rotational symmetry with the tile that you can stack it up in a row and then create another row beneath it that will automatically feed that data path through, kind of like in a, a serpentine path or something. 
then potentially we could tile these without any kind of air wiring. And that's a really interesting idea. So we've discussed a few ideas with how we would handle passing that signal along between tiles. Perhaps there would be some solder jumpers involved so the user could be very prescriptive with the way that the data flows through the matrix using a solder jumper to choose which edge the data passes through. We've also thought about including some resistors so that we can actually create some kind of biasing or preferential data path where if you have two sides soldered, then the data in will be accepted from one of those sides preferentially. The idea being that all you would have to do is solder your matrix together, define the dimensions of the tiling in the code, and because that, that preferential uh, signal path should be known, the, the code can just do the rest for you. You know, we've kind of seen this idea before with say the Adafruit NeoPixel matrix. Their eight by eight NeoPixel matrix has these large tabs and that looks like they're just ground tabs. I have seen other versions that have a kind of rotational symmetry that implies some kind of tiling potential, but it would be really interesting to see if we could get that signal path integrated into these kind of like load bearing tiling tabs that are used to solder the matrices together. In any case, that's all I have for you today. If you have any ideas on how we could integrate that, that preferential signal path into an easily tileable matrix so that we can create libraries around that that kind of break down those coordinates very easily for the user, I'd love to hear your thoughts. We're gonna update the color sensor with that resistor uh, modification to the LED, regenerate the Gerbers, and we're gonna work on some guides as well. Until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>